Hi, this is Steve Roderick Marillion, and you're listening to Sonic Perspectives. Murder machines Fragments of life Too small to see Welcome to another interview of Sonic Perspectives. I'm Rodrigo, and my guest today is Mr. Steve Rodri of Marillion. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Yeah, we are here to, of course, uh, discuss the new album, An Hour Before It's Dark. Incredible title, amazing album art that you see here in the background. And there's so many interpretations of, of uh, this title explored throughout the album, right? Yes, absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I was listening to the album this week and the past week, and uh, in the eminence of the war in Ukraine, I think that title got a whole different meaning in my head, to be honest with you. Absolutely, yes. I, I thought that as well um, <laughs> in these dark days. Uh, yeah. yeah, your heart's got to go out to the people of, of, of Ukraine, really, faced yeah. with such a terrible situation. Yeah. And you were saying to me that you chose this album art as well, right? Yeah, we had, we had various different options presented to us, um, and I just fell in love with that one. I thought it was a, a, a modern, striking image, um, and it just did some things that kind of, for me, really reflected the, the, the music and lyrics on, on the record. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we eventually agreed. And also, the, the artist then gave us various versions of it where we changed certain elements and, and, and I said, no, 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 go back to how it was. The original <laughs> was great. So it took, it took several conversations before we finished up back where we were. Uh, but yeah, I think it, it's one of the strongest images um, we've had. Okay. And writing and recording an album during COVID, of course, brought its share of, share of challenges. Uh, a lot of bands did compilations, covers albums, live releases, just to keep the fan base entertained. And that's fine, but uh, I have to applaud you guys for working on new material, which is, you know, it's not usual these days, I guess. No, obviously the, the, the pandemic slowed down the whole creative process. Um, we had done some some jamming um, before things went to hell, mm. uh, but basically once that happened, um, within a, a few weeks, I made the decision to uh, to shield because it was before the vaccines, and yeah. I had to be careful because of my uh, type two diabetes and my weight. So uh, they did a little bit of working without me, and um, then things kind of improved a bit and, and the case numbers dropped and, and I felt comfortable going in and uh, working together again. And that, that was kind of a real boost for, for me to be able to go and do that again because it's, you know, it's music is my life. It's what I've done for the, the last 43 years I've, since I, I joined Marillion, really. So um, it kind of brought forward a lot of, lot of creativity from me and a lot of just joy from being able to do what we do again. Yeah, there's that whole tension and that whole desire of being productive and, you know, doing what you used to doing, right? And then when you're finally able to do so, I guess it, it meant a lot more than, you know, in usual circumstances, right? I bet. Yeah, I think when you've done this for so many ways, so many years, you can take it for granted to a certain extent. extent. Uh, you know, it's like a never-ending conveyor belt. Um, and having a forced break from, from that whole process... <laughs> maybe makes you think a little bit more about how lucky you are to be able to do this as a, as, as a career. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And although uh, Steve didn't want to write about the pandemic, when, you, when you're living through such a, a moment in history, you, it's got to come out in your work, really. And I think oh, yeah. the interesting thing with this record is that, okay, you have that reflected in, in some of the lyrics, which at times can be quite dark, um, yeah. but, but there's a real joy in the music to... Mm -hmm. uh, to complement or, or contrast with that. So I think the combination of the two has, has given us something very special. Yeah. I, I had a question about that down the track, but I, I'm going to ask it now. Uh, for example, on Murder Machines, uh, it has a very big kind of feel, uh, although you're addressing a gloomy subject. So what's the process like to, to fit those seemingly exclusive things together, like uplifting so sounds, but gloomy lyrics? 
Well, well, quite often in in the early start of the creative process, Steve doesn't usually have finished lyrics, so he'll yeah. maybe just have a phrase or two. So mm -hmm. uh, you kind of, you know, you're not directly reflecting the the lyrical content in the music so much as you, you're just trying to get a, a, an atmosphere based on 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 what the parts of the lyric that there's kind of implying. Uh, and, you know, Mike Hunter has to take a, a lot of the credit, really, for, for guiding us and having a, a clear vision and a plan um, and, and getting us all to agree, because sometimes the hardest thing in a band is getting five creative individuals <laughs> to agree, because you know, we're, we're all a little bit eccentric and uh, we all like to get our own way. So right. having, having someone who can mediate that process is, is very important. Got it. That's one of the hats that the producers wear, of course. It is, yeah, babysitter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the first single, Be Hard on Yourself, uh, there's some incredible lines in there, like, run to us the things that scare you. I heard you say life's what you settle for. I think as a general message, that's awesome. But I kept thinking it's about you guys pushing yourself to expanding yourself and not settling down, not being complacent with each other. Am I right in, in saying that to a certain extent? Kind of. I think, you know, there's, there's still an incredible creative energy between the five of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and we made a decision early on in the creative process that this album had to be as good as it could possibly be, that we're all getting older, we don't know how many more albums we're going to be able to make, and that um, we don't want to release anything substandard and, and fear had such amazing reviews, both from the press and from the fans, that we wanted yeah. to try and use that as the you know, the, the yardstick by which we measured the, the new music, really, which we, I think we did, and I think we've uh, maybe surpassed in places as well. So um, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's, it was quite an achievement through such a dark period, really, to come up with something. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and there's so many different elements that, that came together. I mean, our use of the choirs, um, kind of elevates Crow Nightingale and, and, and oh, yeah. Care to a, a different place where we've never been before. And, and especially with the end of Care, uh, with Steve's lyrics, just seems so incredibly moving, really. Yeah. I like my... Pref my favorite uh, choir noir moment in the album is when... Uh, when in the Crow and the Nightingale, where it says wrapping the sun in silk, and then yeah. they're like sort of elevating that moment and bringing it to a yeah. whole new level. Yeah. No, it's, it's very, very beautiful. And uh, yeah, it was uh, just a, a, a remark that, uh, that Tim, who, who films us, uh, made when we were down sh uh, recording and, and shooting the documentary down at uh, mm. Real World that, uh, that led to it. So uh, yeah, hats off to Tim. He helped really improve this record. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, The Crow and the Nightingale, uh, there's a homage to Leonard Cohen in that song as well, right? Did Literally, he influence, yeah. Yeah, did he influence you? influence you in any way or was it uh, Hogar's idea? That's just uh, Steve's lyrical inspiration, I think, really. Got it. You know, there's, there's almost like two worlds that exist in our creative process and, and that's <laughs> where he's going with his lyrics and and the moods that we create in, in the music and, and how those two things come together. And, and then we finish it with something that sounds like it, it couldn't exist in any other form. So it's quite... Uh, it's quite yeah. unique, I think, in terms yeah. of a way of working. Not always the quickest way of working, but uh, mm. it does come up with some, some very special moments. Yeah. No, I haven't heard of any other band that uses that kind of process. And, you know, there's definitely an impact in how, in, in like, in the end process, in the end product. Uh, Reprogram the Gene, for example, it goes everywhere lyrically. Like, you talk about millennials, androgyny, climate change, covid yeah, you, you're playing some great melodies on guitar there in the background. Uh, I don't know if somehow it works at the end, but it's like how you get to that finished product is a mystery to me. I don't know. Well, this, like I say, there's the two parts of the of the process really because I hadn't heard a lot of the lyrics, mm. um, finished lyrics until the song was mixed. Mm. Because we tend to work a lot at home. I, I record a lot of my guitars at my studio here. Some of the solos, like on Crow and the Nightingale and Care, uh, recorded in my garage at home, my, my Pro Tools system. Um, so it's only really that when you get to that final stage, do I hear where he's taken oh. the lyrics in terms of direction, you know, which is always a, a pleasant surprise, really. And yeah. you, know, you hear all the other elements that Mike's brought together, like the harps and 
getting uh, Impresa Folly again on on uh, the beginning of Crown Nightingale. It's mm. uh, yeah, it's quite fascinating to see from the initial inception of an idea and how it grows to a certain point and then finishes up somewhere almost completely different by the time it's it's finished. Right. And thinking about talking about uh, unfinished ideas or the stem of an idea, Only a Kiss is just a 40 second intermission, uh, but he has such a great bass line from Pete. I have a feeling that there's more to this song than just those 40 seconds uh, and it could yeah, be well, developed into something else, right? But yeah, quite possibly. I mean, the, the reasoning behind the subdivision of the titles mm. was really all, all about um, streaming and, and how bands who don't have more than so many tracks in a record get unfairly penalized. You know, if you have a, okay. a 12 minute track, um, you don't get paid three times what you get for three, four minute tracks, <laughs> even though it takes up the same space, you know. Got it. <laughs> so that, that was um, more based on logistics of, of, of that situation. You know, streaming mm -hmm. isn't a realistic model for the creation of original music unless you're Taylor Swift. Um, so uh, <laughs> yeah, you do what you can to maximize whatever you get. It's still peanuts, of course. Yeah. Just a few more peanuts. Understood, understood. Uh, and I want to ask you about your approach to solos. Uh, you come from the same school as guys like uh, Steve Hackett, Dave Gilmer, Andrew Latimer, uh, where it's not about a million notes per second, but about expressing emotions and fitting the song. Can you yeah. tell me a little bit about uh, your approach? Uh, well, basically, I have no idea what I'm going to play. <laughs> um, so I, with the solos I mentioned, you know, I'll set up a, a sound that I think works in, in my garage and uh, mm. I'll record maybe half a dozen different takes in, in Logic or Pro Tools um, and pick out the moments where I, I find the most interesting, the most unusual or the least obvious because it's very difficult with a guitar. Yeah. You know, you don't want to just play the same licks to everyone else around the world. Millions, mm. literally, of guitarists are all playing exactly the same licks at the same time around the world. So to mm. try and break out of that, you have to almost surprise yourself. So yeah. for me, it's not a... Um, I don't have a game plan from one note to the next. I just try and, and go somewhere unusual in terms of... Um, kind of shifts in the scale or across the fretboard... Um, mm. And, you know, you do that enough times and then you pick out, you know, the bright moments and, and, and put it together. And, and on a good day, you finish up with something that's, you know, unusual and emotional and fits the song. Because ultimately for me, the song is king, you know. Yeah. Great musicians like George Harrison would just play exactly what was required on, on those Beatles songs. And there's a real lesson that so many musicians could learn in that. That yeah. the song is is why you're there. It's not your own ego or to show off your chops, <laughs> um, but to make that song as special as it can possibly be. Yeah. And uh, you were already a professional musician when these guys that play super fast and like not necessarily servicing the song came up, like Malmsteen, Michelangelo Baccio, Chris and Pelletieri. Uh, sometimes it's speed for the sake of speed. What were your impressions when uh, that kind of became the norm in the middle middle eighties, more or less? Yeah, well, I think there's there's a kind of spectacle to that that can be mm. can be fun. I mean, I loved Eddie Van Halen's playing because he he did that, but there was still a like a, a little bit of fun in the, in it and yeah. tongue in cheekness uh, and his his rhythm playing was just mind blowing. Spectacular, yeah, yeah. Um, but all those other guys, I mean, there's a tiny bit of sweet. Uh, picking that I do in East in the Easter solo that mm -hmm. I got from a, a Vinnie Moore video, and I think it's fun to chuck stuff like that in, that in occasionally. But ultimately, music is communication, uh, or it should be, and you know, communicating emotions and and you know, the guitar can be such an emotional instrument if played in a certain way. More more than anything, apart from maybe the human voice. <laughs> You know, you can reach inside and touch someone's soul, you know, and not to do that just seems like a waste for me. If, if yeah. the music's kind of doing that kind of widescreen sort of almost cinematic uh, picture for you then to be able to paint melodies and emotions across that just just takes it to a different level. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a big admirer of your style, and I like what I like about your solos is that uh, they tell a story within a song, like Jigsaw, for example, Uninvited Guest, Easter, Assassin, yeah. 
endless examples, but uh, I, I guess that's what you're trying to accomplish. You're telling like a yeah. mini tale inside a song, right? Yeah. yeah. Like I say, just try not to play the obvious things. Two, two <laughs> of my best solos were completely improv improvised from the beginning to the end. The Easter solo uh, mm. was just done. Um, I, I have no idea what I played the second after I finished playing it. So <laughs> it was, they were just fortunate that they recorded it, that I could then go and learn it and, and, developed the very last part of it. And mm. and again, um, the second solo on This Strange Engine, which is one of my favorite ones, oh, yeah. um, just quite, again, completely improvised. So again, it's this thing about trying to surprise yourself about, okay, you played this, now what do I do now? That's not the obvious place. Mm. And most of that solo is played on one string, so which is unusual in itself. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, you, you guys have reached a sweet spot in your career where you have a solid fan base, but you can go out in the streets and go to the supermarket without being bothered. Uh, yeah. Was that was that always the goal when you guys started? I mean, it, it seems like an artist's dream, you know, to be acknowledged yeah, but that, not bothered, right? That's a sweet spot for me. I mean, we had a bit of uh, fame in the mid '80s when Katie was such a hit, yeah, and. Um, Just being recognized when you're walking around the supermarket, you know, it's not my thing, really. I don't, <laughs> I don't like that that level of recognition or fame. You know, it's fine if it's music fans and, and they, you know, they'll come up to you and say, you know, love what you do or even hate what you do. But, you know, you've been recognized as a musician. But, uh, yeah, I'd much rather be a, be that than a, than a pop star any, any day of the week. Right. So, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's interesting when you go to the countries in the world where you still get played on the radio because you still have a almost like an echo of that happening, like in, mm -hmm. in uh, Santiago uh, in, in Chile. You know, you walk down the street and people are sitting outside at, at a bar and, and you get recognized or yeah. at an airport in the north of the country. So that's quite surreal. Um, but it's fun you know, because the music fans, again, um, yeah. that, that's a, a better level of recognition, I think. Than I guess being so. Yeah. Famous as yeah. such. Yeah. And I actually, I have a question about the beginning of the band, because when you started, punk had already kind of trumped the older prog bands like Yes, Genesis and Gentle Giant, etc. Yeah. They were either like finished or completely revamping their sound. And then you guys came around with songs that were a massive call back to that style of prog with a modern edge. So what explains that success at that time? Well, in a way, it was just at the, at the tail end of the whole punk and new wave movement. Um, and whenever that happens, there's another generation coming up, maybe the younger brothers and sisters of the people who are into punk and new wave. They're looking for their new mm. thing. So there's always a hunger, I think, for new music. Uh, And because we, we weren't just playing the music of the early mid 70s, you know, what we had did have more atmosphere. Yeah. I mean, more, not more atmosphere, more attitude and energy maybe than some of that stuff. Um, so people started to take notice to the point where we could sell out the Marquee Club in London. And, you know, the record companies had to start taking notice of, of that. And, uh, you know, we got signed. And, um, It, it, it facilitated a whole range of young prog bands kind of coming through. Maybe none of them had quite the same mainstream success that we did, but it was yeah. still uh, great that they, they got the exposure they probably wouldn't have done. Yeah. 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 And one thing I must ask you as a Rush fan is about the tours when you opened for Rush. Uh, I didn't see those shows. I was eight or 10 at the time. Uh, But uh, rumor has it that the Rush fans weren't that kind to Marillion. Uh, well, the first time <laughs> they were definitely not at all kind. Um, mm. When we played at the Radio City in, in New York, mm. uh, with, that really felt like being thrown to the lions every night. <laughs> in fact, there's there's an audio recording on YouTube if anybody wants to look it up. Mm. Uh, and, you know, you can hear these guys in the audience screaming at us to get off. Oh. You guys suck! <laughs> you know, <all> <laughs> kind of so it's quite historically interesting. Um, but then by the time um, Misplaced Childhood had come out and, and was a success, and, and, and the guys in Rush seemed to really like it, and we got invited to do several dates with them, um, nearly all the audiences on that tour were fantastic. There was only one... I can't remember where it was in the States where I remember somebody was throwing coins at us. But yeah. other than that, <laughs> we, we went that really well. That's surprising to me because, you know, it's Prague. In principle, both bands should be a great fit together. But 
I'm yeah, a Rush fan. I, I don't understand that, but yeah. No, I think it's some people, depending where you are in the world, have that very sort of territorial <laughs> approach to, to their bands and they don't want to support band of any kind. Yeah. So. Yeah. And uh, you guys are pioneers of the crowdfunding model for a rock band and continue to do an incredibly uh, targeted marketing strategy. How did that come up at the time? And uh, I, I mean, the world was not as connected as it is today. There was no social media yet, for example, right? Well, there was no worldwide web, really, when it first sort of started with the, okay. uh, the American Tour Fund in 1997. That, that was, or, um, there was a message, a message board called Freaks. Um, mm. And we told our fans that we, we couldn't do a U.S. tour because every time we came over, we'd lose $50,000 or $60,000. So a fan <laughs> had the idea of, of starting a tour fund and, and you know, people would, would donate with the idea of hopefully, you know, reaching that figure to enable us to come over. And, and it did. And the biggest single contribution was, I think, from an English guy who just wanted the American fans to be able to, oh, wow. to see the band again. So that kind of... It, it told us several things about you know, the potential of the internet, the the power of of the fan base, and and how our fans really are a global community. I mean, you see that at the Marillion weekends when you have people yeah. from every corner of, of the planet get together, and it's just one long party. Um, so that kind of work is up to the possibilities. Um, and then, obviously, with the Marillion.com, um, just as, as the World Wide Web was starting to kind of happen, yeah. Yeah. Um, was, a, was a good investment, if you like. Uh, we, <laughs> and also, with the, uh, you know, we'd had eight albums with EMI, three with an independent, and we'd, we'd, the three with an independent saw our fan base shrink by more than half. And mm -hmm. you know, we, were, we were in a situation where we, the only option seemed to be signing another deal with these independents and seeing things eventually dwindled to nothing. So that's when, when we had the idea, um, of Mark had the idea of uh, asking the fans if they'd pay for the album a year up front. And enough of them said yes to, uh, to make it happen. And that's the birth of crowdfunding. Yeah. And I think at this point in time, it's all about how you strategize and how you cater to your fans. Like you get people like Neil Morris, for example, he has his own app. Uh, waterfall where everything is Neil Morse and it's like his music is not on Spotify. So maybe Meridian could do something similar, you know, that's, that's a, an interesting concept. Yeah, yeah. The solo works would be there and, you know, extended playlists, like, you know, bands that you guys are part of Peter Wallace is in transatlantic and yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, that's definitely something to, to <laughs> I will, I will look into that. So yeah. thank you for the heads up. <laughs> there uh, you go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's the whole industry's changed so much in the last ten or twenty years. Anyway, um, mm -hmm. most people in the thirty don't own physical product anymore; they'll just stream content as they as they want. And you know, those streams, be it on YouTube or Spotify or Apple Music or whatever, just don't generate the income that you would need to make an album like the one we've just made. So, without crowdfunding, that that album wouldn't exist. Yeah. So, uh, so you know, you have to use all the tools at your disposal. I think you have to use social media, um, and you have to try and give the fans something special. So when they do pay for the special edition or the ultimate edition or whatever, you know, you're giving them a work of art. It's not just about the music. You give them yeah. some, something that will, you know, have worth and value in years to come. I think really. Yeah. And, and speaking of that, in the Marillion Weekends, one of my favorite moments is uh, the swap the band thing where, you know, someone from the audience takes the place of someone in the band. Uh, is that still on? Does that still happen nowadays? Um, it has happened. Um, I don't know if there's any plans. It normally happens in Port Zealand because it's logistically a lot easier there. And that's yeah. not happening now until next year. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's any plans uh, for, for the UK. Um, or Lisbon or, or Montreal, but I haven't heard. I don't even know if you've made that decision yet, but uh, okay. it's always a fun thing, you know, and there's some great <laughs> musicians who are fans of the band and, you know. Yeah. Yeah. One of my, one of my friends did that and they actually formed a band. I don't know if you heard of this, but they formed a band from people who did the same. It's called Swappers 11. Yes. No, I know them. Yeah. Alex yeah. and, and all those guys. Yeah. Yeah. Luis is my friend. He's a keyboard player, but yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so know, I had to 
I heard some of the original stuff that they did. I thought it was very good. Incredible, right? I love it too. <laughs> yeah. 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 And uh, in terms of touring plans, I know that there's a few Marillion Weekends planned for this year. Um, what else is in the cards? I mean, uh, Cruise to the Edge, maybe? Yeah, we've got Cruise to the Edge. We, yeah. we have uh, a European tour starting in the UK in September. Mm-hmm. Um, I have three solo show, shows over the Easter weekend, two in the Netherlands and one in Germany. Um, maybe one in the UK at the end of July, if I can uh, get the venue to reply to me. Mm. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I, I'm guesting with Tangerine Dream next week for three shows oh, with cool. them in, in the UK. So cool. uh, yeah. I'm just working out at the moment what the hell I'm going to play. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but, yeah, that's going to be fun. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, I mean, Marillion is pretty much full on most of this year with just a few few breaks a week here and there. Pete's doing some transatlantic shows, I think, in one of those breaks. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and next year, again, we'll, ha- we'll have several Marillion weekends around the world, I think. Uh, it's, it's not being decided where or when yet. But, mm-hmm. um, yeah, we, we, we tend to have a plan at least two years in advance. Yeah, unless COVID, you know, trumps everything and then you're back to the drawing board. But well, enough, of that. Uh, enough yeah, of that. Yeah, we just ho- hope there's not a, a more serious variant that comes along and, and, yeah. and bites us all on the backside again because uh, yeah. that would really suck. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you did mention some solo shows. I mean, your solo album came out in 2014. Any yeah. concrete plans to do a follow-up or? Oh, so many things happening. I've, I've been working. <laughs> uh, the thing is, the Brilliant Album's taken most of my creative energy for the last year and a half, to be honest. Mm. Um, but I, I am half, nearly halfway through my uh, Revan Too Late, my space-themed um, album. You know, I, I released the La Sia track on, on, on uh, oh God, what was it now? Probably about a year and a half ago. Um, okay. And I've got another track that hopefully is going to be coming out called X15. Mm-hmm. Um, and the rest of the album, I'd like to get imagine it's going to be out at some point this year. But uh, I've got loads of things happening. I'm doing an album with Thorsten from Tangerine Dream. We had a couple mm-hmm. of sessions, one, one in Berlin and one at the Racket Club. I'm doing an album with Steve Hackett. Um, oh, wow. Which That'll has be been special. Like an, yeah. an ongoing process. Steve yeah, mm-hmm. and I are great friends, and that's been kind of on and off for, for mm-hmm. various and we try to really move it forward but he's so busy and I'm so busy that yeah you know, <laughs> I'll do another Steve Rothery band album at, at, at some point um, either the end of this year or beginning of next hopefully um, so I've always got a lot happening put it that way I'm, I'm never Excellent. bored yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> well last question for me uh, Marillion is a rare case of a band which uh, changed the singer remained successful and to a certain extent stayed in good terms with the previous singer to what do you credit that what the, that we all still get on? Yeah, <laughs> um, I think we're all eccentric in our different ways. Very five very distinct personalities, even with different musical tastes. But um, I think we now we've learned to make allowances for each other uh, right. and to acknowledge the fact that when we're together, we create something quite remarkable. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, we do get on really well. There's very few bands I know of that uh, have been together for 33 years. And, you know, I'm just talking about since Steve H joined, you know, with, without kind of murdering each other, really. And I think <laughs> that's probably because we're not a nostalgia band. You know, most bands who have been around this long are, are all really kind of the great and they'll tour the greatest hits. Um, and we're still very much about what we're doing now in, in, in the moment. So I think that keeps things fresh for us. And, and uh, while you have that buzz, that creative energy, you know, you'd be, you'd be crazy to, uh, to blow it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Steve, thank you so much for your time. And thank you for the amazing record. Uh, I look forward to seeing you. Uh, I live in Toronto, so I'll be in Montreal for your show. Excellent. So, right. yeah. I'll All see right, you come there. say hi. Yeah, I will. All right. Bye. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, man. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.
for your words are flogging It doesn't really matter Whether or not I understood them It doesn't really matter Where they take me Or how they take me